Okay, so we now have our very special guest, live and direct from Peru. He's actually in the cupboard over there. <laughs> and um, and he's, uh, from, he's in Lima now, it's midday there, so it's a nice bright cloudy day there, no doubt. Um, and I've just been with Brian on a two week tour around Peru and Bolivia. We had quite an intense journey, to say the least, and we saw a lot of... <laughs> I'm not sure quite what you mean, you think I mean by that, actually. but. Anyway, we just, I've just got back from Peru, so I'm a little bit exhausted, and Brian no doubt is as well. And we're going back there actually next June with Andrew Collins, our special guest, and we're going to be comparing the sites in Peru with Gebekli Tepe and other such sites. So Brian is a well-known figure in the alternative mysteries world. He's been researching Peru and Bolivia, and most importantly, the elongated skulls that have been discovered from around Paracas, but also in all the other sites around Peru, including Tiwanaku, even Machu Picchu, and many other sites. This is a book he's co-authored with David Hatcher Childress, and he's written several other books about the prehistory and the Inca era of Peru. So, please give a warm welcome to Brian Forrester, live and direct from Peru. Okay, thank you so much for um, for being here and and uh, listening to me from Paracas, Peru. And my presentation is about the phenomenon of elongated skulls, uh, which have been found actually all over the world. Um, every continent that's been occupied by humanity, except Antarctica, as far as we know. Next. These are three-dimensional depictions that have been done by an artist called Marcy K. Moore, mainly of the Paracas um, elongated skulls. And she's an expert on the facial features of Native American people. And these are her renditions. Uh, the strange thing is that I took up this study because no archaeologist or anthropologist was looking at the phenomenon of elongated skulls of the Paracas culture. They're studying the textiles and ceramics, but for some reason, they're completely dismissing this very in phenomenon. Next. This is probably the most famous elongated skull in the world, and it is from Paracas, Peru, from a very specific cemetery called Chongos. Next. And in fact, all of the largest elongated uh, conehead skulls in the world have been found in one specific cemetery near Paracas called Chongos. These, of course, have been uh, labeled as being Nephilim or Anunnaki or God knows what else. But all that we really know is that this culture died out about 2,000 years ago, and the cranial deformation was only done by members, two members of the royal family. Next. So what you see in this picture is the top left, top right, middle left, and uh, lower right skulls are all from this one cemetery called Chongos, which is about a 20 minute drive from where I am seated right now. Next. And people tend to automatically jump to Egypt when you talk about elongated skulls, especially the time period of the Amarna family, as in Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and Tutankhamun. On the left is a stone depiction of Metatotan, who was one of the daughters. And of course, on the right, we have Nefertiti herself of the 18th dynasty. Next. But the thing is, as far as I can tell, no actual skeletal remains have been found which um, equate the elongated skulls of the art forms, as in murals and sculpture, with the actual remains. The skeleton or mummy on the right is believed to be a member of the Amarna family and has probably been misidentified as being Nefertiti herself, who, as far as I know, has not been actually found. Neither has Akhenaten. The only one we do know of, of course, who may uh, not have even been a son, is Tutankhamun. Next. And here we have Tutankhamun himself as um, 
portrayed by the National Geographic Society and the Egyptian Council of Antiquities, uh, if you can trust them in terms of their interpretations. Next. And what we do see is that he did have a skull which is not exactly normal. His cere uh, cerebellum um, is larger than normal, but he is in no way a what one would necessarily call a cone head. Next. And this is an actual CAT scan of Akhenat, or sorry, of Tutankhamun uh, below. Uh, you can see the sort of pinkish color of, of his skull, and it does look quite odd, I would say. But having seen uh, him in person in the Valley of Kings, um, I'm not sure this is an, is an exact uh, copy of what his skull actually looked like. And the one above is reputed to be Akhenaten, but again, Akhenaten has not been found. It's more likely that he was not only killed, but that his body was cut up into several pieces and cast in different directions. Such was the hatred of the Amun priesthood for he and his family. Next. But the question is, why would he have his family portrayed uh, especially his children with these huge skulls. There must be something to the story. But the question is, did they look like this? Or was he trying to hint that ancient ancestors, in fact, of their royal bloodline looked like that? As in Osiris, perhaps. Next. Uh, again, the phenomenon of cranial deformation of uh, was all over the planet, most commonly 2,000 years ago. One of the last groups to fashion their heads in this way were the Mangbetu people of the Congo, who claimed their ancestry from Sudan. And from there, they claimed that their ancient ancestors came from Egypt. So there's a possible link there with uh, the Egyptians. Next. And up until the 1950s or 1960s, the royal children had their heads bound um, to create this amazing looking shape. And uh, it was, again, recently that they did this. However, the government and missionaries banned the practice. And so it is no longer uh, practiced by these people. But when, actually, when we were in Egypt in April on a cruise, there were members of a family from Nubia who were sitting at the next table and two of their children had elongated skulls. And I was too embarrassed to try to take photographs of them, but we saw the phenomenon uh, as early as less than a year ago. Next. So you can see the graceful look of uh, one of the Mangbetu women who was a, um, uh, a person of cranial deprivation here. Next. And also, when we go to Vanuatu, which is in Melanesia, uh, the same phenomenon occurred up until recently. Again, it was banned by missionaries and the government. And in their oral tradition, these people claim ancestry from Egypt. They claim that they sailed from Egypt through the Red Sea probably about 2,000 plus years ago. Next. And this is another example of uh, one of the children from the Vanuatu area of Melanesia. Next. Some of you will have heard of the skulls of Malta, which uh, at one time were on display. There were at least 200, which were abnormal in shape. But rather than being vertically elongated, they were horizontal. Uh, I would love to go to Malta and see if we can get access at some point. But as you all probably know, um, irregular looking skulls in general, if they're in museum collections, tend not to be on display. And the reasoning behind that um, is unknown, uh, whether it's a cover up or what, I am unsure, but that happens also in Peru and Bolivia and other countries. Notice that the, the skull below only has one suture. 
Technically, every human being living today has two sutures. You have the coronal suture here, and also what's called the sagittal suture, which divides the parietal plate in behind into creating a T-shape. But here, there is only one. Next. And in the areas of uh, the Middle East and Russia, this is a Russia example of ancient cranial deformation amongst the royalty. Uh, again, most common in the time frame of about 100 AD to 400 AD. And the influence moved from this region into Europe around the same time. Next, even Attila the Hun and his people performed cranial deformation. Um, so again, you have a royal bloodline altering the shape of their skulls to make themselves look different from the common folk. But the question is, why would you have this phenomenon happening on all continents, um, more or less around the same time frame, about 2,000 years ago? Next. And in, uh, this is in Austria. And this could actually be influenced from the east, moving westward. This woman died approximately 400 AD and was a member of some ancient royal family of that area. The elongated skulls of Europe have been found in Germany and France and um, England and all many other locations. I'm presently trying to map exactly where they were and at what time frame. Next. And even into the Middle Ages, Royal Europeans would have their heads cranially de uh, deformed in order to look different from the, the common people. And it could be that that's why uh, some of these royal people wore, as you would know, the sort of conical or cone-shaped hats to, at least in public, either enhance or hide their actual look. Next. So when we go to Central America, amongst the Maya people, we have cranial deformation. Uh, the problem with this area is the soil is very acidic. So very few elongated skulls have been found because the soil itself tends to break down the calcium carbonate, whereas in a place like Peru, especially on the coast, it's uh, extreme desert, which is perfect for preserving uh, bone material, and even textiles. Next. And the mysterious Olmec culture. Again, that area, uh, the soil is very acidic, and so very few examples um, can be accessed. But my wife and I are going uh, to tour the Olmec and Toltec area of Mexico uh, probably early next year. And we're going to focus on the Olmec and Toltec sites because you really have to go to these locations in order to get local information, as well as access to little museums that tend to have gorgeous specimens which are not in museum catalogs or on the Internet. And by bribing the officials, <laughs> it's often quite easy to get access to their collections on some occasions. Next. And Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. As uh, Hugh just stated, we were recently there with Megalithomania with 35 very happy guests. And there was a collection of at least 30 extremely elongated skulls at Tiwanaku itself, but that collection was removed about five years ago. Uh, the display was papered over, and we were very fortunate that we were able to a newly opened Tiwanaku Museum in La Paz, where they have three elongated skulls on display. And from talking to the museum curator, he said, I may have access to their entire collection of skulls and mummies next year. Next, including this specimen. This was also found at Tiwanaku, and I inquired about it. And he, in fact, said, yes, this is in our collection. So I'm very hopeful that I'll be able to document this one um, at some point next year. Notice the size of the head. 
as compared to the torso. This is an extreme example of cranial deformation or an example of a non-homo sapiens sapiens. Next. And living in Peru, you get to see so many amazing things. This was a baby, possibly two years old, uh, that was found in a house in the Sacred Valley of Peru in a collection of a tomb robber. So the problem is we don't know where it was taken from. However, um, it is most likely in the national collection in Lima, and I'm negotiating at present to have access to what they call the skull room, which has 10,000 Peruvian skulls. Notice the golden fingernails. It's, some of this gets so weird. Next. And in Cusco, of course, this is in the basement of what is called the Cori Cancha, which is the, was the sacred center of, um, of Cusco and the Inca. These skulls Hugh and I saw along with our group, and they have been list or they're listed as being from 1532. However, <clears throat> since they have not been carbon 14 tested, uh, it's simply a guess, and we are actively undergoing a process of carbon 14 DNA testing ancient skulls of Peru, which is an incredibly complicated process. Next. And so most archeologists state that this is how um, cranial deformation was done. This example is from the United States, from literally what are called the Flathead Indians. And it's a, a process of cradle boarding done to members of the royal. Next. And then other contraptions were used as well in order to flatten the skull. Um, but what we'll get into is the fact that uh, this kind of deformation has a tendency of flattening the skull. And we'll see examples that would have been very difficult to have been done using simplistic processes such as this. Next. This is how the Peruvians did uh, their cranial deformation. And the uh, Paracas culture, uh, those who lived in many other areas perform this process. And so predominantly you find what are called conehead skulls in Peru and Bolivia. Interestingly enough, wherever you find a site, uh, if there is a museum there, you always find elongated skulls. We've never been carbon-14 nor DNA tested, but there's a strong correlation between megalithic sites and elongated skulls. Next. And even until recently, the people of the jungle close to Cusco uh, performed this process. Next. But then you wind up with very intriguing examples such as this one. This was sketched in, I believe, 1842. It was a fetus believed to be eight months old and stillborn. And notice the size of the skull in relation to the body and notice the teeth. An eight month old fetus does not have teeth. And this is one of the characteristics that we're tracking when we're looking for the difference between cranial deformation of Homo sapiens sapiens and something else. Next. Again, it's in the artwork that we see um, depictions and there has to be some realistic component to it for there to be this artistry in many different parts of the world. This again, of course, is the Amarna period of Egypt. Next, but in Peru as well, this little artifact, which was found near Tiwanaku, the central figure is the creator god, Viracocha. And uh, flanking him on the left and the right are two women um, of greater stature and even greater head shape. Unless they have incredibly fancy beehive hair designs, we're looking at a very intriguing phenomenon of this area, which of course also relates to very mysterious constructions in stone 
both at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku. Next. And again, this also is from Tiwanaku. And both the last figure you saw and this one, and the next one, please, have been authenticated by Senior Juan Navarro of the Paracas Museum as being authentic. So these are minimum 1,000 to 2,000 plus years old found at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. And notice either the, the hunchback or something is on, you know, or they're wearing a backpack, which Eric von Daniken would call a spacesuit. But who, you know, who honestly knows? We'll need to get many more examples in order to figure out what's going on with this. Next. So my main focus has been on the Paracas area where I presently am, where you see the arrow. And if you notice the road systems, those are the modern roads, but they also reflect that the modern roads were built on the ancient Inca road system, which in turn was built on a much older road system. And if you go, if you travel from Paracas eastwards, you're traveling on the ancient road, which connects you with Cusco. And then as you travel north and south from Cusco, um, you find many of the famous and not so famous megalithic structures are along these roads and at almost every single one of them, I have found elongated skulls. So again, a correlation between ancient megalithic and elongated skulls. Next. And this is what the Paracas are believed to have looked like. We're talking about a Native American people who, at least in this depiction, resemble something more like a rug merchant from India than someone who is Native American. And underneath that turban-like thing would be the elongated skull. So no serious um, academic is looking at this culture whatsoever. So I upon myself to do it, along with many different colleagues, including uh, Hugh and, and Andy and, um, and other, other people. And it's great that Andy and Hugh will be here in June uh, to once again look at this phenomenon and report back to you. Next. Now, the Paracas had this incredible um, system of burial where multiple layers of, of textiles would cover the uh, the deceased in a fetal position. And the strange other thing is that um, even the archaeologists admit they have no idea where the Paracas people came from. There is no genetic relationship so far in our DNA testing between the Paracas people and the people of the highlands of Peru. So it is suggestive that at least part of their ancestry comes from elsewhere on the planet via the Pacific Ocean. Next. And this is a Paracas. This has been carbon-14 tested at being 2,000 years old, um, approximately 2,000 to um, 2,100 years old. And notice the shape of the skull. But even interestingly, notice the, the hair color. Initial testing indicates that this individual had genetically red hair and also the hair is curly or wavy and it is finer than Native American hair. Native Americans have black hair. Uh, this is not most likely the result of oxidation or dyeing. Every, almost every elongated skull that has hair still attached to it from Paracas is red. Next. And this again just shows you uh, the continuity of the color. It's not like a Scottish or Irish uh, or Scandinavian red. It's a deep, rich auburn. And so it's quite unique. So initial indications are that uh, red hair originates in the Middle East. And we're starting to draw a correlation between parts of the Middle East and the coast of Peru that this could be where this bloodline came from originally. 
Next. The Paracas covered um, quite a large area, not just this, uh, not just the Paracas Peninsula, which you see, um, or even what this map shows. They covered um, an extensive area of very advanced agriculture uh, going all the way eastwards into the highlands of Peru. Next. And even archaeologists will admit that the famous astronaut, which is found in Nazca, where the lines of geoglyphs are, was created by the Paracas people who lived there before the Nazca people. And he is the most enigmatic because he is on the side of a mountain and he's obviously waving at somebody. Also, if you see the figure of the whale, that was done by the Paracas culture. So the Paracas culture were doing uh, drawings on the land uh, hundreds of years prior to the existence of the Nazca. Next. And this is a Nazca figure. You can notice the, the difference in uh, basic design from one to the other. The Nazca were more, much more geometric in shape. The Paracas were more fanciful in what they did. And um, evidence is suggesting now that the Nazca culture invaded Paracas territory about 100 AD and wiped out the royal family. So that's why amongst the Nazca, you have no elongated skulls and very little red hair. So I think the Nazca were warlike and annihilated the Paracas, uh, terminating their bloodline 2,000 years ago with remnants going through the Nazca. Next. The famous Candelabro. This is the beginning of the so-called Nazca line system, which goes from Paracas in the northwest down to and through uh, Nazca to the southeast. There's an area in between called Palpa, which contains at least 1,000 geoglyphs and lines on the tops of mountains or mesas. So the Nazca system is not just Nazca, it starts at the Pacific Ocean. Next. So the next landmass to the west is a little island called Easter Island. There you have these giant Moai figures, and some of them still have these red things on their heads. Most archaeologists believe that they represent a form of hat, but Hugh and I have been to Easter Island, and I have asked the local people, and they said that the ancient ancestors of Easter Island were red-haired people of great stature, and that they originally had elongated skulls. Next. And the more that I, I travel around Peru, the more access I have to collections of elongated skulls, which will be the subject of a book at some point. But Hugh and I were given uh, exclusive access to the Ecomians uh, collection a couple of weeks ago, I think. And he noticed the number of very weird looking skulls that are in there. One of the strangest being the top left hand example which if you put in isolation and took a photograph, practically anyone would say that's an alien. Next. They were also experts at the art and science of nation or brain surgery 2000 plus years ago. Uh, most of the uh, sur surgery was done either in the forehead or the back of the head or the top of the head. Some say this was the result of uh, warfare where someone would get whacked in the head and uh, the pressure would have to be uh, released. But it is quite likely that the Paracas act engaged in brain surgery in order to possibly trigger some of the glands like the, uh, the pituitary and the pineal to try to trigger some um, extraordinary capabilities of the mind which the ancestors may actually had. Next. Yikes, I can't see. Oh, actually, I, I can't make that out. Oh, okay, Here's this is an example. Uh, we had doctors with us um, on the trip with you, and I said, is that a, uh, a blow to the head? And they said, no, that is a very successful trepanation. 
where the bone was cut out and then grew back. So this person lived for years beyond this um, journey. Next. This is what your skull basically looks like. You have the frontal plate, the two parietal plates, and the occipital plate in behind. Next. And again, if uh, basically all human beings on the planet at this present time have a frontal plate and two parietal plates. Next. But then we have the paracus where in some instances we only have the coronal suture, we do not have the sagittal or parietal suture in existence. Next. And here in close-up you can see there's not even a remnant that was ever a suture there, and any medical professional who's looked at these are simply dumbfounded. They don't know what they're looking at. And if you're looking at either a side branch of humanity that died out, or alien human hybrids, this would be something that you would probably see. You'd see characteristics which don't fit the blueprint of Homo sapiens sapiens. Next. And this is another example. It's not that there are uh, is one example. The most interesting of the elongated skulls always have a lack of the parietal or sagittal suture. Next. And then this is the back of your head. That's the occipital plate below, and then the parietal above. Next. But the paracus skulls and most of the elongated skulls have these two holes in the back of the head. Um, and they are usually parallel like that. Uh, even medical professionals believe that what this could be is that this was a way for blood and nerve flow to an elongated skull because of its greater size, shape, and, and in some cases, volume. Next. And in close-up, you see these are not puncture wounds. These appear to be natural. Um, so they would possibly be an evolutionary feature. Next. And here we have Baracus, 15th century a Inca period human skull of a farmer found about 20 kilometers east of where I'm sitting. And next, then we have the Paracas. So I still don't understand why archeologists are not looking at this phenomenon. You clearly can see the difference between the last photograph and this one. Next. And you see how complex this shape is. I find it very difficult to believe that this would be the result of some primitive binding technology in involving a, a board and some string. Uh, this to me is so complex in design that I think we're looking at one of the last descendants of what could have been naturally born, elongated, sculled human beings. Next. The question is, what or how would their brains have functioned? Because each cranial deformation, if you extend the shape of the brain, how does that infect the different centers and how they function uh, with each other? And how does contact between the left and right hemisphere when the, the shape of the brain is so different? Next. This is a classic example that um, I know those of you who have been with us on the megalithomania tours have seen. This is a skeleton called Waikiki, believed to be to have died 900 years ago. Waikiki's skull is the size of her torso. And unfortunately, she's the only example we found so far. Initial genetic tests show that she was female, but doctor who's looked at this can figure out what's going on because the fontanelle on the top of the head which you can see is open is indicative of a child less than two years old and yet the dentition is that of an eight or ten year old and as well x-rays of uh, recent x-rays of the skull have shown that no secondary teeth are coming in 
So you have either a two-year-old or a nine-year-old with permanent teeth, extremely big eye sockets, and a skull the size of its torso. Next. And this just shows you the size of Waikiki. This is Sigur Renato, who is a caretaker. And I've, I've been given allowance by Senior Renato to extract a, DNA, a, a bone sample from Waikiki for DNA testing. So those of you following the DNA um, fundraising that we did, and um, thank you so much. We have been buried in bureaucratic paperwork, which I am cutting through with a chainsaw at this time, because um, the bureaucratic system in Peru is absolutely appalling, but we are making a lot of, um, of headway with it. We now have a PhD uh, archaeologist in Spain who is overseeing this process. We have the geneticist in the United States. We have the carbon-14 lab in the United States. We have the director of archaeology in Lima stating she's very interested in our testing. The only thing we have left is for our Peruvian archaeologist to take the samples that we have to the director and ask her to allow us to mail them to the United States. As soon as that happens, we have more than sufficient funding to do the DNA testing. We were able to raise $7,000 uh, thanks to individuals. We now have more than $50,000 to do this. Next. And this is what Marcia Moore believes Waikiki looked like. Very different from the child down the street. Next. This is another one of her uh, depictions of, of what she thinks uh, Waikiki may have looked like, including the possibility she had red hair. Next. Some of you may have heard of the Star Child Skull, which is on the left, uh, to which Lloyd Pye dedicated 12 years of his life of sheer frustration because of uh, naysayers and, um, and others getting in his way. Very brave man, Lloyd. He was able to find at least 25 characteristics of the star child skull, which are not Homo sapiens sapiens. Unfortunately, there's only one star child skull, and in order to do proper testing, you would need five or, or ten or more. But, you know, God bless Lloyd. And here it's in comparison to a, a normal human on the right. Next. So here, here is Lloyd with the star child skull. He unfortunately died almost a year ago. Um, but I'm carrying on some of this work um, in his memory because he was fascinated by the elongated skulls of Peru. Next. Ah, but maybe there is a second one. And where's this? This is in the Paracas History Museum, which uh, Hugh was able to uh, videotape uh, on our recent tour. So again, Senior Juan of the Paracas History Museum has said, I can take a bone sample and have this little individual DNA tested as well and carbon-14 tested. Next. This just shows you um, the very irregular nature of this skull. <laughs> and it's fun to have uh, doctors, or not lawyers, doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals look at these because they are, again, they can't explain them away in terms of known disease. They simply don't know what they're looking at. Next. And this, honestly, is what Marcia Moore believes this skull looks like if you put flesh on it. As strange as it looks, um, she's, she's a very unbiased person, and she simply depicts what it is that she believes that she yeah. and she's doing all of this for free because she's simply like many of you intrigued with what's going on or what was going on in the past next so um, I, I honestly can't read this because of the angle but um, this is the result of the very first results of our Genetic, uh, geneticist in the United States, and as you can see, some of the sequences 
of the DNA of the Paracas do not match anything known. They do not match 100% with any known haplotype, with any known human being, or even Neanderthal or Denisovan. So we're looking at something which is very intriguing, and uh, this is just the beginning of what we're getting into. Next. Again, many, many doctors have looked at these. Uh, the unfortunate thing is those that have been very intrigued, like Dr. Here, uh, who was on a megalomania tour with us, um, they're so excited when they see them, and then they go home to their countries, and I never hear from them again. Oh, well. Next. Again, one of Marcia's depictions of what she thinks the royal Par uh, Paracas looked like. Next. And other examples. Next. And again, another example. Um, no recreations have been done to my knowledge by archaeologists, so that's why we're doing it, because we want to know what was going on 2,000 plus years ago on the coast of Peru and other parts of the world. Next. And this example was found at Pumapunku, but not in Pumapunku itself, on the grounds of a restaurant just outside. This skull was unfortunately stolen soon after I took a photograph, but another um, similar to this, a sample was taken by someone and sent to the United States, and the journalist is as perplexed with that sample as he was with the samples that were sent from Paracas examples. So uh, we'll see what happens as time goes on with this. Next. Um, that's Ellie Marzulli, who actually was the man. Uh, he's an author. He was in charge of doing the fundraising, which has brought us $50,000 for DNA testing. And we are, uh, once we start to get the process moving, he does have other donors who may be willing to donate a further fifty dollars to $100,000 for this, for this process. We want no... Um, we want no funding or financing from any government or institution because we're doing it independently, but we are going to do all of this with full cooperation and assistance from the Ministry of Culture of Peru and as well the Ministry of Culture of Bolivia to make it official. Next. And this is one we still have to find when we were driving from uh, Lake Titicaca with the Megalithomania tour. I spoke with our uh, liaison, Gustavo, uh, who is our assistant uh, on uh, many of our tours. And uh, he told me how to get to this little island in Titicaca, which you will not have heard of, that has a very tiny museum, which has specimens such as this which were found in funeral towers. So that's going to be upcoming next year, possibly for the megalithomania trip of um, November of next year, or maybe with Andy Collins and Hugh in June. Next. And this shows you what is called the path of Viracocha, which Hugh knows very well about. This is where you find most of the megalithic works in Peru and Bolivia. And along this line, you find a very high um, number of locations of elongated skulls. So the ancient works and the elongated skulls are interlinked somehow. We have to now work on timelines as to when they were made um, and by whom. Next. And I just found this, uh, this drawing last week. This is from Biblios in Lebanon. So that's new to me. And uh, we are going to go, my wife and I are going to go to Baalbek in March uh, to document the incredible works there. At least we're going, <clears throat> unless they're dropping bombs on the exact site of Baalbek itself. 
if they're shooting at each other within 100 miles, um, I don't really, you know, that's their problem. But um, um, unless they're actually destroying Baalbek, I will be there in March. Next. I have no idea what that is. Ah! This is a new, a new lead as well. This is a, a new location in, uh, in Bolivia that I'm going to be exploring next year. Uh, notice the shape of that skull. It's south of the Tiwanaku area, um, so there's always more to look at, and uh, that's what makes this work very exciting. It's similar to ones you may have seen from Mexico, but a different location. Next. And last week as well, someone sent me this, uh, this photograph of a, a little skeleton with red hair in a museum in Germany. All we know is that it comes from Peru. But again, look at the hair, the color of the hair, the fineness and waviness of the hair, and the fact that the skull is the size of the torso. So I'll be trying to track that one down as well. Next. And when we were on the island, or actually near the Island of the Sun uh, with you, and that's what's great about the Megalithomania tours, is that we always find new stuff as we're traveling. Um, you know, we never go to the same places and look at the same stuff, because I have a tendency of poking around with, with little bits of money in my hand to um, offer contributions. I have a tendency of being able to access things which uh, most people don't have access to. But this, uh, this is in a little tiny museum on the shore of Lake Titicaca. Um, it just keeps going and going, folks. Next. So if you're interested in Egypt, uh, please come with us in March uh, with the uh, chemist school. Or if you can't make that, next. Then I'll be doing the first ever elongated skull tour of Peru and Bolivia in May, as shown here on my website, hiddenincatours.com. And if this one doesn't interest you, then next. Then come with Andrew Collins, myself, and Hugh in June, where we look at the elongated skulls, uh, the megaliths, and possible relationships between what we see in Peru uh, Egypt and Gobekli Tepe and other sites in Turkey. And there is no next. Right, um, thank you Brian, nice to see you again, even if it is over the video. Um, and um, anybody got any questions for uh, Brian, lady down there? You didn't mention in your talk, but I think you may have mentioned it elsewhere. Um, there's a limit, isn't there, um, anatomically to how much cranial deformation can be achieved by the, the methods that you were showing historical um, illustrative examples of. Um, so. What is your comment about the volumetric extent to which you can change the shape of the skull versus the, the size? Because you were showing two different things there, the different shapes and the, and the different sizes. I just wonder if you could just comment a little bit further about that. Um, well, some people have believed that um, the skulls, which are larger than normal, uh, contain either air or fluid pockets and that the, 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 the brain doesn't um, completely occupy the interior of the skull, but every example I've seen, and I've seen many broken ones, as well as inspected them with flashlights inside, every single example of which there are hundreds that I've seen, the brain completely fills the, the cavity of the skull because you can see the impression of where the veins of the, of the, um, of the, the veins of the brain were. Well, the, the, the brain simply, uh, filled the entire you know, the entire uh, cavity of the, of the skull, uh, no matter how deformed or odd looking it is, um, that's simply the way, you know, the way it was. Hold on. Next question. Right. How would the um, 
missing sagittal suture on some of the skulls of the children, how would that complicate labour for the mother? Okay, um, what was asked is the missing sagittal suture um, on the children, how would this complicate, how would it complicate labour? Yeah, the, the fact that the suture, which obviously is this area across there, how would that um, affect labour? Any thoughts on that, Brian? Yeah, sure. The, um, the medical uh, who've looked at it, and that really puzzles them, they don't understand how the child could be born. Uh, because you require, you know, you, the head has to be the way our, our head is in order to go through the birthing canal properly. So the only suggestion they have is that the hips of these women had to have been of a completely different configuration to make allowance for the fact that there were only two plates and not three coming through. Hi, Brian. Um, yeah, can you tell us, please, uh, roughly what percentage of the elongated skulls don't have the perennial suture? Right, okay. Um, what the gentleman asked is um, what type of percentage of the elongated skulls don't have the sagittal suture? And he okay, is it? that? Yeah. Well, of the, of the hundreds I have seen, I would say no more than 5%. Okay, okay. Uh, what I do find interesting, and I'll say this to you, Brian, as well, is that the, the suit, that same suture is missing from certain hominid fossils um, found around the world, particularly to do with Homo erectus. It's out of interest. Um, but I do then. Right, one second. Right, go on. Do, do you actually have any theory as why only the scalps has, have been found and not um, remains of the body or the skeleton? Okay, what the lady's saying is that, uh, have you any idea why uh, it seems that only the skulls are being found as opposed to the rest of the body, you know, the rest of the skeleton? But I presume that the answer definitely is going to be that there, there is other skeletal remains anyway. But I mean, I think what she's saying is, is there are quite a lot of heads being found without skeleton? Uh, yes, because unfortunately, um, the skulls quite often come from tomb robbers um, who don't know anatomy whatsoever, but they do know a strange looking skull when they see it. So uh, the, the skulls are often removed from the bodies and the bodies are, are destroyed by tomb robbers in the process of trying to get hold of valuable things like silver, gold, and um, pottery, but they do have more than 300 intact mummies in the, the Central Museum in Lima, and so I'm hoping to get access uh, to, to them at some point, and other skeletons as well, in situ in the Paracas area, to see if there are abnormalities. The obvious thing one would look for is six fingers, but... Um, just anything, um, ir irregular shaped ribs, irregular numbers of ribs, um, what, what their overall height be. Um, so that's, that's on, yeah, that's the next process. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Uh, gentlemen there? Right, wait for a second. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the, the wider skulls. And uh, there's one in particular in a museum in Juarez which uh, Brian may or may not be familiar with. And there are also images early on in the, the slideshow which uh, Brian didn't talk about, but which uh, show these types okay, of skulls. Okay, but, but before we go any further, let, let's, let's introduce this subject. You can just finish here. Right, there's a, was it a museum at a place called Qua, Qua, Juarez. Juarez. You know, a, music, a, 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 a museum at a place called Juarez. Where is that in? Juarez. Juarez. Yeah, yeah. Peru, is it, presumably? Yeah, Peru. Okay. Um, and that there are skulls there that are much wider. There's, there's one in particular which is much wider. A much wider the, skull two there. Hemispheres. Um, two hemispheres. Like that. Like right. Shape. Right, like um, two different things. I mean, basically, it would seem that in this museum there are some skulls which are uh, 
seem to be deformed that are much wider in appeared and seem to have like two hemispheres. Are you aware of those, Brian? Uh, not as well. Actually, Hugh knows more because I, I haven't been to that museum yet. Uh, Hugh has been there, and unfortunately, there are, there's almost nothing in terms of resources on the internet. But my wife, uh, my wife's family comes from there, so we will be focusing on that museum this year. Right. Did you know anything about it, Hugh? All right. Okay. Right. We'll leave that one. Um, right. A couple more questions then. We'll. Uh, Leave Brian in peace. Anybody else at all? Is that the difference in? Ah, right, yes. Yeah, Brian, um, question is, is there any difference? What the hell's going on there? Oh, I'm going down the hole. Um, <laughs> uh, any uh, difference in teeth in the skulls at all? I mean, obviously, in Amer with the American giants, you have the double rows of teeth and things like that. Is there any um, anomalies or anything to do with the teeth, to do with the skulls? Oh. The tendency of having a few, fewer teeth than us, uh, and I've been told by dental professionals that have looked at them that it seems they had some kind of genetic condition whereby certain molars didn't form. So you'll find gaps in the jaw. Okay, so in other words, um, aside from the other possible genetic differences, there are definitely uh, genetic differences with the teeth as well, possibly. Yes, yeah. and I, I believe they, they've also found that with the, the Iraqi skulls, you know, the ancient Iraqi skulls seem to have some genetic problem too. Right, yeah, and, and okay. All right, okay, I think it's going to be the last one, so uh, where are we going with this? There was one hand over here, I believe, or it's gone down there again. No, that's it then. Brian, okay, we'll leave you in peace, I think, and just say thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. And uh, obviously myself and you, um, and hopefully some of you here, will join uh, Brian next year in Peru and Bolivia. So thank you very much, Brian. I'll see you soon. Thank, thank you, you so much, all of you, for coming. Okay. All the best. Thanks.